Look, can everybody hear me and see me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. All right, let's get started. So hi, everybody. My name is Willow. I'm a third year PhD candidate at the University of Delaware, and I'm working with Dr. Federica Bianco. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how low can we go? Minimum spectroscopic requirements for exotic supernova subtype classification. Essentially, the overarching theme of our project is we're trying to see how well we can classify low resolution, uh, how well we can classify exotic supernovas, specifically stripped envelope supernovas using low resolution spectra. So let's get started. Let's first take a look at a high resolution spectrum. This is at R equals 738. Uh, and the R value is the spectroscopic resolution, which is equivalent to the lambda divided by delta lambda. This is a fairly typical spectrum. This is super, supernova 1998DT. It's a 1B, uh, it's a 1B supernova, and this particular spectrum was observed near the phase of zero, which is to say this supernova was observed near the max brightness of that particular supernova. The spectrum has had its continuum removed, so what we're left with is the spectral features. Now, these are core collapse supernova we're dealing with generally, um, at least what I'm interested in. So 1Bs and 1Cs, and they have been stripped of their outer envelope of hydrogen. And in the case of 1Cs, they've also been stripped of their outer envelope of helium. They will lack a singly ionized silicon absorption line, which will be around 635 nanometers. That's usually present in uh, 1A supernova. 1Bs and 1Cs will show oxygen, calcium, and magnesium lines as they age, where 1A supernova will become dominated with iron lines. And as I say, 1C supernova will also lack helium lines at 587 nanometers. And this is a 1B supernova, so we seem to see that about right there. All right, great. So now what we want to do is what if we were to degrade, what if we were to simulate observing this supernova at the same time but from a lower resolution spectrograph. So let's take a look. This is what that would look like from a, resolu from a spectrograph with a resolution of R equals 50. You can see the bins have become a lot wider. The data has become a lot coarser. We've apparently lost a lot of spectral information here. And so what we're wondering is, is classification still possible? Probably yes, there still seems to be a lot of spectral information here, although a lot has been lost, but how good would it be? And we can take this many steps further. This is an R equals 10 uh, spectrum. Spectrum, And you see here we have six different spectrographic uh, spectral bins. This is basically equivalent to photometry at this point. And it seems like classification should barely be possible or at least just as possible as, as it is when you're doing photometry. So this is our goal. Our goal is to find this minimum spectral resolution at which classification becomes no better than a random guess. Now, no talk about low resolution spectroscopy will be complete without mentioning the SED machine and the associated machine learning model SN1A score. The SED machine is a robotic spectrograph uh, it has a spectral resolution of R equals 100, and its goal is to accomplish rapid follow-up classification for fast transients. SM1A score is a recurrent neural network, and it focuses on classifying 1A supernova, although it can classify all different types. And specifically, it minimizes, it aims to minimize the false positive rate for the identification of 1A supernova. For those non-cosmologists out there like me, minimizing the false positive rate is very important because any uh, contaminants, any non-1A contaminants in your cosmological measurements uh, can really hinder your progress. And so minimizing the false positive rate is pretty important. In this table taken from their paper in 2021, you can see four different models that they show. SM1A score TPR, this is the highest true positive rate for 1A supernova that they could achieve while keeping the false positive rate less than 1% and for SNID and DASH, two other spectroscopic-based um, machine learning models to classify supernova. This is, again, the maximum true positive rate they could achieve while keeping the false positive rate less than 1%. SM1A score FPR, this is 86% true positive rate, and that is the maximum rate they could achieve while keeping the false positive rate at 0%. 
So we know that low resolution classification is already done, but what doesn't exist is a comprehensive evaluation of classification power for individual supernova subtypes as a function of resolution, as a function of spectro, spectrographic resolution. And so we are attempting to provide that systematic study with this work. Now, how do we simulate low resolution spectra? Well, we start from a catalog of high resolution spectra. Like I said before, R equals 738, that's fairly high resolution. And we get this from SNID or SNID. But how can we perform this analysis without low resolution spectra, of course, right? We need to somehow build this. And again, we started with high resolution spectra and we convolve each spectra with a Gaussian kernel, depending on the spectral resolution you want to degrade to. This is a GIF showing that process and the resultant convolution is in orange. And to get the resultant spectra, we simply linearly interpolate between the new wavelength points of this convolution. Okay, so now let's take a look at the data set and the first model we applied this to. The first model is SNEPCA. This is from Williamson and Majaz and Bianco 2019. This is a machine learning model based off of principal component analysis and a support vector machine classifier. Now our group is particularly interested in stripped envelope supernovae. And so this classifier is specifically designed for stripped envelope supernovae, specifically 1B, 2B, 1C, and 1C broad. So we started our analysis with this model and let's talk about the model a little bit. First of all, the data is split into four phase groups. Now each spectrum is divided into these four phase groups. The time of observation relative to the peak brightness of the supernova is its phase. That is a phase of zero indicates that the spectrum was observed at the time of peak brightness. Now within each of these phase groups, one spectrum from each supernova is taken. Principal component analysis is performed on that entire phase group. Next, a support vector machine classifier is used to classify on two of these principal components. And this is what we're seeing in this figure. We're seeing this two-dimensional feature space as defined by the two principal components. And the support vector machine is using these lines here. It's dividing up this feature space into classification regions. You can see the orange red here is 1C classification, the green is 2B, and so on. Now, the two principal components that were chosen, you can see here, we can see PC1 and PC3. They're chosen based off of the two that provide the highest uh, classification accuracy in the end. Now, our improvement to this was to use the first five principal components um, after we've already replicated the study. The drawback to using the first five principal components is that we won't be able to make a plot like this. Of course, it's very difficult to illustrate a five-dimensional feature space. But nonetheless, what we did is we ran SNEPCA for this data set at various different uh, spectral resolutions to see what would happen. How would the classification accuracy change? And this is what we get. So let me guide your eye here on this plot. Each of these four panels represents the four different phase groups. The top here, we have a phase of zero. So all of these spectra are within five days of peak brightness. These are within five days of five days after peak brightness and so on. The blue curve represents the replication work that we did where we chose the best two principal components for the support vector machine. And you can see the classification accuracy depending on the phase group is around 50 to 60%, high, even high as 70%. We improved on this model, as I said, by using the first five principal components. And you can see at high resolution, all the way on the left here, we start at around 80% classification accuracy for all four phase groups. This red line also allows us to see the drop off. How does this classification accuracy actually degrade with decreasing spectral resolution? And you can see around an R equal to 50 is when the change starts to occur, when the classification accuracy starts to drop off. The important thing to note here is that our random guess accuracy for this data set is about 25%, but the classification accuracy never drops below about 50%. You see, we even go down to R equals 10 and R equals five here, which means that only six or fewer bins, six or fewer wavelength bins is allowing us to classify at an accuracy of, a, of about 50%. These results are still under investigation. The next model that we started to investigate was DASH. 
Dash is the deep automated supernova and host classifier. It's based on the paper Mutha Krishna et al. 2019. And this is the figure from that paper uh, explaining, the, explaining the architecture. This is a neural network, a convolutional neural network. And specifically, this, this classifier aims to not only classify supernova type, but also the supernova age. And so you'll see here at the very end, at the soft max readout layer, we have 306 different classes. That's 17 different supernova types at 18 different uh, age bins. Okay. And the way this model works is we start from an input spectra of length 1024. This gets reshaped into a 32 by 32 image. This goes through two rounds of convolutions, one densely connected layer of length 4096, and that's uh, fully connected to the final softmax readout layer. Now let's take a look at the data set that Dash uses and that we used in our replication of, of the Dash results. There are 517 unique supernova, and unfortunately we had to discount, uh, discount two peculiar supernova. This is because the only one in the data set was supernova 1987A, and although it was extremely well observed, there was only one, and so we couldn't have just one supernova in the data set. There were about 4,000 spectra in the data set, and this was amplified through their data oversampling to about 2 million individual spectra. Uh, through their oversampling, they added copies of the spectra to the data set with injected noise and shifted redshift in order to artificially rebalance the data set. Now, they're not adding in any new information to the model, so the bias towards 1A normals will always be present, but it lessens the problem. And finally, we only accept uh, phases, we only accept spectrum, spectra whose phase is between minus 20 days and plus 50 days. The more nebulous phases we're not so interested in. So let's take a look at the results from Dash that we replicated. You can see here, this is a confusion matrix. There are 16 supernova types. We first ran Dash, we reproduced their results at high accuracy and high resolution. And this is a confusion matrix. They want to classify, as I said, both supernova type and age. So they split their data on a spectrum by spectrum basis. This means that spectra from one supernova could be present in both the training and the testing set. Now we want to classify supernova that haven't been classified before. So we from now on, we have been running Dash by splitting the data on a per supernova basis. So let's take a look at the replicated results first. 1A normal is in the top left here, and you see we have a 99% classification accuracy. The false positive rate is somewhat higher for 1A normals. Again, this is because of the data imbalance problem. We go through 1A91T, 1A91BG, 1ACSM, 1AX, 1A peculiar. We can go through the 1Bs as well. 1B normal, 1B narrow, 2B, and 1B peculiar. The 1Cs, 1C normal, 1C broad, 1C peculiar. And finally, two Ps, two Ls, and two Ns. You can see one C peculiar is the kind of the odd ones out here with a 0% classification accuracy. It's unknown exactly why this is the case, but of course, there weren't very many one C peculiars in the data set. So now let's look at a confusion matrix at high resolution from Dash when we split the data on a per supernova basis. We would expect the accuracies to, great, to, to degrade somewhat, but let's take a look. Again, you can see we have 99% classification accuracy in the 1A normals again, 1A91Ts, 1A91BGs, and 1A CSM still going fairly strong, but the false positive rate is still somewhat of a problem for the 1A normals, again, because of the data imbalance issue. Generally, we still have fairly good classification power for many of the supernova types, but not good in some of the other ones. That doesn't really matter. This confusion matrix is really the benchmark for our analysis. It's the best we can hope to do with high resolution. So now let's take a look at what happens when we run Dash at many different spectral resolutions, right? When we degrade our entire data set to various different spectral resolutions and see how the classification power degrades. So this is that plot. Starting from the far left here, we start at a classification power of about 85%. The blue curve here represents the subtype accuracy. That'll be one of the 16 different supernova types. And the orange curve represents the broad type accuracy. This is 
classifying whether it's a 1A, whether it's a 1B, whether it's a 1C, whether it's a type 2 supernova. It's obviously a much simpler problem. And so the classification accuracy is higher always, around 90%. Now, before I get ahead of myself, let's just come back to the SCD machine. This is where the SCD machine lives at R equals 100. And you can see we basically see not very much at all degradation in classification power, at least with Dash. It's only not around R equals 50, but R equals 25, extremely low resolution spectrum. And this is giving us fairly good results still, but this is where, that, uh, where things start to turn, right? Where the classification power starts to go down. I have three different horizontal lines plotted here. The top one, the thick line, is what would happen if you would classify everything as a 1A supernova. That's at 45, 47%. The dashed line here is the broad type random guess. There are four different classes of broad types. And so the broad type random guess is going to be about 25%. The subtype random guess is the last dotted line down here. This is one in 16, that's 6%. The amazing thing is, again, is that we don't see any of these models dropping below random guess accuracy. Willow, you have five minutes left. Thank you. So let's take a look at some confusion matrices from this astounding result to see what they look like. On the left here, we have high resolution, spectra, uh, high resolution confusion matrix from before, and on the right, we have one from R equals 50. You can see qualitatively, they're pretty the same. The, um, the classification power for most supernova subtypes hasn't degraded very much. If we go to R equals 10, which is well beyond the, that, that joint, that disconnect, then we see that the classification power degrades across the board. This is pretty amazing, and I hope you think so too. Uh, for future work, what we want to do is we want to create some sort of data product that says, you know, this is the accuracy versus the spectrographic resolution uh, for each supernova subtype. We'd also like to determine whether different classification methods can be optimized for certain subtypes, for example, modifying the loss functions or using ensemble methods for supernova type classification. You know, it could be possible that we can have a whole battery of machine learning models to deploy to classify a particular supernova. Each one is, uh, each of those models is tweaked to a particular supernova. And then finally, we need to consider how signal to noise ratio affects classification accuracy too. It could be that a lower resolution spectrograph does not have the same signal to noise ratio as a high resolution one. And so that, that's essentially the next steps. I would like to thank all of you for listening. Please ask questions, and I'm going to end on this plot, which I hope you find as interesting as I do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Willow. It's reassuring to know that there are people out there working on figuring out exactly when our machine learning methods work and when they fail. That's absolutely going to be very important. Are there any questions for Willow? Many. We'll start with Gotham. <laughs> so this is um, a in really interesting talk to me, but what it's really suggesting is that we should stick a prism right in front of LSST and not bother with imaging at all and just get a bunch of low resolution spectra. Um, so what kind of facilities are you envisioning using this kind of, of technique with? Which yeah, so is, yeah. Go for it. yeah, so we hope to provide this information, we hope to provide, you know, a single, maybe even something as simple as a simple, a simple table that says this is your classification power for a particular spectrographic resolution, and just send that out into the world for anyone who is going to be following these transient alerts or anyone who's designing new, uh, new spectrographs. Because really, what this is saying is that maybe a, a lot more spectrographs then people realize can be doing good spect uh, spectroscopy um, and they don't even know it yet. So hopefully this information could be supplied to as many people as possible. Yeah, hi, this is Andy Howell. Um, so are you assuming that you know the redshift? And then the other question is, um, you know, I think you're only doing this at one epoch, right? If you have multiple epochs of color in principle, you have a lot more information, which we'll naturally have. So how, how would this compare to that? Right, so 
both models that I've discussed, SNEPCA and DASH, um, the way we ran them were irrespective of Redshift. DASH does have the ability to take into account Redshift, but when we ran this, we did not provide that information. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat your second question? It was, are, are you taking into account uh, multi-epoch information? Like uh, if you have multi-epochs of color, that's very powerful compared to one epoch. And is this comparison just with one epoch? Right, so by epoch, you mean like one one spectrum from for each supernova? Yeah, that's right. So, oh, right, so, so, right. So when we run SNEPCA, that takes one spectrum from each supernova, that's how that works. But when we run DASH, it's just all of them. So if you've got a very well-observed supernova, then all of them are going to go in there. And that was the distinction that I was trying to make is that the way DASH is doing it, they're also predicting on age and supernova. So they could have spectrum, spectra from the same supernova. Uh, they could have, you know, 40 spectra from one supernova in the training set and then another 30 in the testing set. And so you're absolutely right, including all of those available spectra really does increase and multiply the data set. Other questions? One from Alex Kim over in the corner. Hi, this is Alex Kim, and this is more of a comment for the community and not a question for the speaker, but I think it's important to remind ourselves that the reason why SED machine has a resolution of 100 is because of the 60 inch aperture and for uh, electron readout uh, noise. And when we're thinking about next generation spectroscopic machines, when we we have access to 2.5 meter telescopes and skipper CCDs with sub-electron noise. Um, we could go to an R of a thousand before we um, hit the, the noise limit, detector noise limit. So it's interesting to see what we could do in um, kind of current instruments, but looking forward, I think um, we should be asking the question, what can we get if we had higher resolution instruments? Because people are actually thinking about these things now. They look at SED machine and say, oh, here's a cheap option. Let's just copy it. But if we can get a lot more science now with the larger apertures and the detectors that we have now, we really should uh, push in that direction. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Other questions? I don't think there was one in the chat. Uh, hi. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I think the question I'm going to ask is uh, one level for the, uh, an extra difficult problem to solve, I guess. So how much a resolution can we go low so that we are able to get redshift information from this? Like, so and it is not going to be uh, uh, um, applicable for a whole broad class of supernovae, I feel, because uh, what lines are we going to measure? I mean, um, I, are we going, going to measure? Uh, is it would be yeah, uh, different for different classes. So, I mean, how low can we go so that uh, we are able to classify at the same time we're also able to get a, a um, measure of distance? Right, yeah. So that's something that we didn't tackle at all. We were, we were totally irrespective of redshift in this analysis. But that's a very good point because if we can, I'll head all the way back, you know, it, it's, it's very easy to get redshift from this, but perhaps, much more difficult from this. So that's really an open question at this time, at least to my knowledge. And a final question, if there is one. If there's, oh, there is one. Okay. But it's not a question. Can I just have a quick comment in response to what Alex said, which is that, yes, of course, we sh I think we should, I think we all agree that we should see what awesome science we can do with really high spec spec res resolution spectrographs at new facilities, but we are still going to be starved of follow-up facilities. And so being able to build a low resolution spectrum is something that is within reach of a lot of communities that are not involved within Rubin at this time. And they could become involved if it proves to be an effective way to classify the thousands of supernovas that we get every night. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. And we are now going to